give God one more big hand clap of praise in here. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated in God's presence. Amen. I'm so thankful that you're here today. I knew the crowd would be a little bit uh, scarce just because of being so cold and the snow and so thank you for braving the weather. Thank you for those that are tuning in on Facebook today. We pray that you have an encounter with God right there in your living room, in your car, in your kitchen, wherever you may be watching and joining in with us. Thank you for tuning in. I have a word today in my spirit. I don't know how long I'm going to preach. Uh, I typically preach, I think, about 40 minutes. Is that probably right? I, I, I never really time it too much. The first time I ever preached, I remember um, it was at Herrick Baptist Church in the big city of Herrick. Uh, The pastor asked me to preach, and I got up, and I think I talked about 12 minutes, and I thought I preached an hour and a half. I said everything I knew to say, Levi, and uh, I said it with passion and fire, and when it was done, it was about 12 minutes long, and I was like, wow, I thought I went an hour, and uh But there's times where I preach 20 minutes. There's times where I preach 30, 35, 40, 45. I've preached an hour and 15 minutes before. Um, I don't usually go that long. But uh, I think today might be a 20, 25-minute one. I have no idea. But it's a word, and I believe it's for somebody in this house today and for someone watching through Facebook. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 4. Exodus 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to drop down and read verse number 20. Um, I told Connor last night, I don't know how revelatory this message is. I don't know how deep this is. But I'm telling you, I feel like it is a word for someone. Maybe it's for me. Maybe it's for someone out here. But I truly believe it is a now word for someone. Exodus 4, verses 1 through 4 and verse number 20. I'm going to be reading out of the King James Version today. Verse number 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in your hand? What is that in your hand, Moses? And he said, this is what he answered, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Did I skip verse 3? Did I read verse 3? Okay. So verse 4. Verse four. Let me read it one more time. My glasses are fogging up on me really bad, and I already wiped them off, Aaron. I don't know what's going on. I guess I'm just sweating. I'm too hot-blooded. And the Lord said to Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it and it became a rod in his hand. All right? Verse number 20. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. I wanted you to see that last part again. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for what we feel in this house already. I thank you that your presence is here, and I thank you, Lord, for the ones who braved the weather and drove from the north, south, east, and to the west, Lord. I pray right now, God, that our eyes and our ears naturally but in the spirit would be open to receive this word. I pray the anointing be upon me to preach, and Lord, I pray right now that hungry hearts would be filled. And I pray in Jesus' name, lives transformed. And I just ask this now, in that holy name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Set your Bibles down. Give God one more big hand clap. Give, one, give God one more big hand clap. Amen. Have you ever felt like you weren't good enough? Have you ever felt insignificant? You ever felt like you didn't have what it takes to accomplish the task that was set before you? Just wave at me. 
you've ever felt like. I know I have on many, many occasions. And I believe right here in Exodus chapter number four, this is probably the mindset of Moses. I believe he probably felt inadequate. I believe he probably felt that he wasn't equipped. I believe he felt that he wasn't uh, ready to do what God was calling him to do. He probably felt that he wasn't good enough to speak because Moses had a stutter. Moses had a speech problem. Moses probably felt that he was insignificant. Here he is. He's off working as a shepherd for Jethro, his father-in-law, and he has an encounter with God, and God begins to call him. And I am certain right here in this passage of Scripture that Moses felt inadequate, less than, not good enough, just like many of us in this house today and those that are watching through Facebook. Many times in our lives when uh, uh, we have an assignment, so to speak, if it's work, if it's something in ministry, sometimes we feel inadequate, insignificant, that we're not good enough to fulfill the task that's set before us. But let me tell you, when God gets in it, you can And I believe right here, Moses might have been feeling insignificant, but when God got in it, everything began to change. Can you say amen? I'm preaching a sermon titled this, If God is in it, if God is in it, high five your neighbor and ask him, is God in it? Is God in it? Is God in it? Those of you watching at home, high five your neighbor, high five your dog, slap him on the head, do whatever you got to do. Ask him, is God in it? Is God in it? The rod that was found here in Exodus chapter number 4 was nothing special. It was just a stick. Thank you, Brother Jim. Where'd he go? He's not in here. Brother Jim made this for me yesterday. I messaged him, and I said, hey, bro, you got a staff? And he said, no, I don't. My last one I gave to your dad. And I said, well, my dad's not going to be here. And he said, I'll make you one. And I said, really? I don't want to put you out. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting around. I'll make you one. He made this for me so I could have an illustration today preaching. And he's not in here to get the accolades. Brother Jim, every, hey, everybody's giving you a hand clap because of what you made that's in my hand. But just as this rod, this staff, this walking stick is in my hand, Brother Jim made it, but it's not anything too special. It's, it's just a piece of wood. It's a staff. It's a walking stick, just as it was for Moses In Exodus chapter number 4, Moses had a rod in his hand. There was nothing special about that rod, that staff that was in Moses' hand. It was just a rod. It was a walking stick. It was a shepherd's staff. And please hear me. And if you want to take some notes, I hope you do. Because I told Connor last night, um, everything I'm going to say today, I believe, is a nugget. Um, It may not be long. It may not be revelatory. But everything I'm saying today, I feel like the Lord gave me, and it is a a nugget. So I want you to write this down. As long as Moses kept that staff in his hand for his own use, It was an ordinary stick. But as soon as Moses released it and gave it to God, it became an instrument for God's anointing, God's power, and God's authority. Did you get that in your spirit? As long as Moses kept it to himself, hmm, as long as Moses kept it and used it for himself, it was just an ordinary stick. But as soon as he gave it up to God, released it to God, that what we would say an ordinary staff turned into an instrument that God used with a demonstration of signs, wonders, and miracles. Why? Because he surrendered it to God. Mm, Are you hearing me right now? I want you to see something in this passage of Scripture here um, because I want you to know what's going on. You all know the backstory. Moses killed the guy, he fled, he left Egypt, and now he's married, he's, he's working for his father-in-law Jethro, he's being a, um, a shepherd taking care of his father-in-law's flock, and he has an encounter with God, the burning bush experience. Wave at me if you've ever heard of the burning bush experience. He has a burning bush experience. God reveals himself to him, and he's having a conversation.
conversation with God. And God is calling him and telling him, I'm going to equip you. When you go to Pharaoh, because that's what he was telling him to do. When you go to Pharaoh, you tell him that the I am sent you. And, and he said, I'm going to use you. You're going to be a mouthpiece. You're going to do signs and wonders and miracles. And I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. I am certain that Moses felt insignificant, inadequate. Here he is. He, he killed a guy, and now he's living in a far-off land. But God has an encounter with this man by the name of Moses. There was a true encounter that took place. I want an encounter with God to where my life is radically changed. Come on, somebody. Who wants an encounter in here? Who wants a burning bush experience to where your life will never, ever be the same again? So he has this encounter with God, and God is telling him, you're going to take the Israelites out of captivity, out of bondage from the land of Egypt. But here in this passage, in this conversation between Moses and and God, I want you to see this. God didn't go up to Moses and ask him what it was that he was lacking or what it was that he was needing or what it was that he didn't have. Read it in Scripture. He didn't go up and ask. He called him. He's talking to him. But in that conversation, he didn't say, what do you need? What are you lacking? Are you hearing me? He began to talk to him and tell him what he was going to do. He didn't say or he didn't ask Moses what it was he was in need of. And I feel like that's for a word for us here at Catch the Fire Church today. God is wanting us to do some things. God is the one who equips us. He's not asking what it is that we're lacking or what it is that we're in need of. Are you hearing me right now? Because if that was the case, all of us would come up with some type of excuse. I know I would have, and I tried <laughs> when I was running from God. Most of you, 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 I'm the pastor, but listen, just because I'm preaching behind a pulpit does not mean you don't have a call to ministry. And most times we try to find an excuse. And if God was having a conversation with us individually like he was with Moses, God is not asking you today what it is that you're in need of or what it is that you're lacking. Because if he did, most of us would say, I don't have enough money. I don't have the right education. I know I've said I didn't go to seminary. I don't know scriptures well enough. I'm not a good speaker. I didn't come from a prominent family. And the list could go on and on and on, and we can make up excuse after excuse to not be used by God. Are you hearing me right now? I'm preaching to somebody that needs to hear this. Let me say this. This is powerful. God never directs our attention to our failures or our shortcomings or things that we don't have. Did you hear me? We see it here in Scripture. God's calling him, and God's the one saying, I'm going to equip you. God never directs our attention on things that we don't have. That sounds like the enemy of our soul. He's the one that's going to point you into the direction of saying, you're a failure, you're a nobody. You didn't come from a prominent family. Your dad wasn't a pastor. I don't know why you want to be a pastor. You're going to fail. Your church isn't big enough. The enemy of your soul is the one that points you to your lack. The enemy of your soul points you to what you don't have. God never does that. Are you hearing me right now? Woo. This is good stuff. Mm. Before I move on, if, if the enemy is saying that kind of stuff to you, that you're not good enough, that you're a failure, you're not going to make it, your marriage is going to fail, you think you want to step out in ministry, ha, you're not good enough. If the enemy is saying that kind of stuff, I just want you to stomp on his head today and say, devil, you're a liar. Devil, you are a liar. The devil is a liar. Can I get an amen right now? What we may have in our lives may seem small in comparison to maybe some other people around us. It may seem insignificant, but please hear me. What you have is enough to get the job done when God's in it. <laughs> Did you hear me? What you have may not seem like much compared to some other people, but I'm not trying to keep up with the Joneses. I know who I am in Christ Jesus, and I know it's all because of him. It may seem small. It may seem insignificant. But when God's in it, we can get the job done. I wish somebody would say amen right now, individually and corporately. You may feel like what you have to offer is small. It might feel insignificant and so on. But this is where what I call the God factor 
comes into play. I, I typed that out. I went back through my notes yesterday, and I sat back down at the computer, and I typed it out because the Lord has dropped that word in my spirit, God factor. God, you may feel insignificant, but this is where the God factor comes into play. Because with men, it may seem impossible, but with God, come on, somebody. I said with God. You might not be able to get that job on your own. You might not really in the natural be qualified, but with God. Come on, are you hearing me? You might not be able to stand up and sing in front of hundreds of people because of nerves and anxiousness, but with God. Come on, are you hearing me right now? That is the God factor. If God is in it, nobody can stop it. If God is in it, no man can stop it. If God is in it, no devil in hell can stop it. God makes all the difference. The anointing, the God factor makes all the difference. Can you say amen? You might not be the greatest singer, but when the God factor, when God's in it, when the anointing gets on you, are you hearing me? The anointing makes all the difference. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I know I'm not the greatest preacher in the world. There's a lot of great orators out there, but I'm telling you something, and I don't take it for granted. I know the anointing is upon me. Why? Because God's in it. I've released it unto him. I said, God, I may not have a lot, but what I have, I'm giving it to you, and he is using it. It's called the God factor. The anointing makes all the difference. Can you say amen? Now, I am going to do a little timeout soapbox. I do believe that there's times where God handpicks and chooses people to do things. But I truly believe that every one of us in here, if we surrender to God, surrender our hearts to God, surrender our lives to God, just like Moses, and said, you know what I have may not be a lot, but I'm going to give it to you. God will use it. God will use you. Are you hearing me? Somebody needs to hear this. The devil may be telling you you're not good enough, not educated enough, but the devil's a liar. Heather, I told her, I walked up the stairs yesterday, I said, remember that old song, that old hymn? It said, little is much when God is in it. Hey, there was another miracle I just sung in tune. Marla, did I? Just please, come on, please tell me I did. But I started thinking about little as much when God is in it. Amen. If God's in it, you'll never have to question it. If God's in it, you'll never have to doubt it. Because you'll see his hand, that anointing on whatever it is that you're accomplishing. If it's ministry, if it's a marriage if it's a business, whatever it may be, if God is in it, you'll never have to doubt it. You'll never have to question it. Woo. Come on, are you hearing me? God makes all the difference. The anointing makes all the difference. Well, pastor, what's the anointing? It's when the power of God gets in you or on you for a specific purpose. Whatever that purpose may be, it's when God gets in it and on you. The anointing. He paints you, smears you with the anointing of his power and authority. And whatever that purpose may be, if God is in it, no man, I said it earlier, no devil in hell will be able to stop it. Can you say amen right now? Please hear me. It's not your ability. We want to make people preachers because they're good orators. They look good. They, they look the part. They're six foot tall. They're skinny. They wear skin tight black jeans and they look really cool. And, but, and they can talk good. You're a fork tongue snake is what they are, lots of them. We want people to get up and play music at a church because they, they're so good. They're like rock band people. But I'm telling you, I want the anointing. It's not your ability. It's not your knowledge. It's not your talent. Can you say amen? It's not your personality. It is not your popularity. All that matters is if God is in it. Is God in it? <laughs> when you're weak, that's when God's made strong. In your shortcomings, in your what you would call failures or what people in the world would look down and say, you're not qualified enough. And all of your inadequacies, that is when God shines the brightest. Can you say amen? Here was a man named Moses. He, he was a murderer. He killed someone. Now he's snuck off and he's marrying somebody that he probably shouldn't have been marrying. 
He, he stuttered. He had a lot of shortcomings. He had a lot of inadequacies. But God still used him. Are you hearing me right now? You may not be the greatest speaker in the world. You may not be the greatest husband, so to speak, in the world. But you can still accomplish things when God's in it. When you surrender it to God, your marriage will thrive. When you surrender to God, your work will thrive. When you surrender to God, the church will thrive. Are you hearing me? Is God in it? Yeah, He is. <laughs> Come on. Come on, somebody. I don't know who needs to hear this. But Jesus is wanting you to know today, he's all you need. He's all you need. When God gets in it, that's all you need. He's a difference maker. You ever been to a church and you know the presence of God's not there? Why? Why? How can you know that? Because his presence is Because he's a difference maker. You ever seen a marriage where the presence of God's not in it? Woo! I want Jesus in my marriage because he's the difference maker. We need the Lord in our marriages, in our work, in our businesses, in our church, in our services, in the preaching, in the teaching, in the singing, in our talents, in our giftings. Because when he's in it, it makes all the difference in the world. Are you hearing me? And when God gets in these things that I just listed, whatever that is, will never be the same again. Amen, amen, amen. The rod that Moses ha had in his hand was very insignificant. It was just a stick. Just a stick. It didn't amount to much. It was a little sapling and cut down and sanded down and it looks pretty good and sturdy to walk with, but all it is is a wooden stick. But when God got in it, miracles started happening. Are you hearing me right now? Moses had never seen his staff do the things that he saw it do. He never seen it turn into a snake and back to his staff again. It all happened because God was in it. It happened because God was in it. Please hear me and write this down. God was using something small, yet accomplishing something great. You may feel small. You may feel insignificant. Mm, but God will use you. God was using something small like this staff, yet accomplishing something great. God will use something insignificant to get his will done. Did you hear that? God will use something insignificant to get his will done. Let me give you some examples. God took a donkey and used that donkey to speak, speak to a rebellious prophet. God took an axe head and made it float and commanded this young man to reach out and snatch it and grab it for himself so he could experience the supernatural on his own. God took a little bit of oil and multiplied it so he could sustain a family. Are you hearing me right now? God took a wooden box and called it the Ark of the Covenant and that's where his presence would be dwelling. God took a shepherd boy with a sling and a stone to take out a giant by the name of Goliath. Are you hearing me right now? God took five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 people. God took 120 people in an upper room and empowered them and changed the world. And we are reaping the benefits today, 2,000 years later. Please hear me right now. God will use something that looks so insignificant to get his will done. The same with this staff. The same with Moses' staff. It looked insignificant, but God used it for his glory to accomplish his will. Amen, amen. Moses' rod symbolizes something that is weak with no power or strength on its own until the power of God got on it. And we, us humans here today, we're just like that rod. On our own, we're weak. No power, no strength, and no life. 
But when God gets in you, I feel like preaching right now, life comes. Empowerment comes. You'll be able to do things that you didn't think you were able to do. Why? Because the anointing and the power is upon you. You have a purpose now. You have a life and life more abundantly when God gets in you. God will take something so insignificant and give life to it. (laughs) Are you hearing me? On my own, I was empty. Somebody can relate to this. On my own, I was powerless. And I felt very inadequate, and I felt very less than. I had a false sense of security. Are you hearing me right now? But when God got in me, my life was radically changed forever and ever and ever. I can now stand up behind a pulpit in Cowden, Illinois and preach the unadulterated word of God to a crowd this size. I can go to Canada or South America or the UK or West Africa or Southeast Asia and stand and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in my inadequacies, in all my failures and flaws. God was using something that seemed insignificant to get his will done where lives would be transformed and changed and hearts would be mended. All because I surrendered and gave my heart to Jesus Christ and he came into me and my life was changed. Just like that staff, that rod that Moses had, it looked insignificant. But when it's surrendered to him, he'll come in it and he'll use it for his glory. Who's getting this in their spirit right now? All because God, all because God is in it. And when God's in something, Let me say it like this. When God gets in you, everything begins to change. You can't remain the same. I love 1 John 4, 4. I quote it all the time when I preach. You probably get sick of me saying it, but I don't care. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Why can I say that? Because he is in me, just like God was in the rod that Moses had. Can you say amen? Please hear me. Please hear me. It was only when Moses released what he had to God, the power came in it. Don't miss this. This is very powerful here. It was when Moses, what he had in his hand, it was when he released it to God is when the power came in it. He had a burning bush experience. He had an encounter. Like some of you have had an encounter. Many of you have had an encounter with God even 15, 20 years ago, but you never truly surrendered. Ooh, somebody needs to hear that. It was when Moses released what he had in his hand is when God could use it. Are you hearing me right now? This is powerful to understand. When Moses released the rod to God, that is when God could use it. It's only, and somebody say only. It's only. When we fully surrender ourselves to God, that he can use us. Let me say that one more time. Somebody needs to hear it. It's only when we fully surrender ourselves to God that he can use us. If we surrender to God, then his power can be manifested through us. Growing up, I wanted to be something different. I wanted to do something different. I never dreamed that I would ever stand behind a pulpit and preach the word of God. I wasn't a Christian, didn't believe in it. I, was, I said I was atheist, but I was probably agnostic. I, I had a conversation with my mom down in their toy room by the pool table, and I remember her crying one time, and she said, I, I think you need something. I think, you, I, th- I think maybe you just need to go to church. And then to this day, I still feel so bad because I cursed at her. I cussed at her like a sailor. And I said, woman, don't talk to me. I don't even believe in God. And I remember stomping off and leaving And I was full of anger and hatred. And I would have never dreamed that I would be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it all happened, please hear me, when I fully (coughs) surrendered myself to him. Because when you fully surrender yourself to God, that's when his power and authority can be manifested through you. Does that make sense? You can give God a hand clap. Your life may seem insignificant, but when you surrender to God, his power will come in you, and you'll never be the same again. I want you to look at verse number 20 one more time. This is powerful to see. I want you to see this. 
Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And here, this latter part of this scripture is what I want you to see. And Moses took, watch the wording, the rod of God in his hand. The Lord began to show me this yesterday. Earlier on, and I read it in Exodus 4, 1 through 4, God's talking to Moses. They're having this conversation, right? He just had the encounter with the burning bush. Then he's talking to Moses here. And he asked Moses early on, I believe it might be in verse number 2, he says, what's in your hand? And he says, it's a staff, it's a rod. I'm a shepherd, it's just what it is. It's just a walking stick. But if you, it was Moses's. But if you look at verse number 20, Moses took the rod of God. Think about this for a second. This staff was used by Moses to shepherd his father-in-law's flock. But when he was using the staff for God's benefit, God was getting all the glory. It's no longer, please hear me, it's no longer Moses' staff. It is now the rod of God. My life is not my, oh, come on, somebody. My life is not my, oh, it belongs to him. I want to know today, what do you have to offer God? What's in your hand to give him? What's in your hand, Doug? What's in your hand, Aaron? What's in your hand, Marilyn? What's in your hand, Paul? What's in your hand, Mark? What can you offer God? If you surrender it unto God, it's no longer yours. It's His, and He will get all the glory, whatever it is that you surrender unto Him. Are you hearing me right now? Are you hearing me? To you, what you have to offer the King of Kings may not seem like much. I know it didn't with me. I was a broken boy. That's what I was. I wasn't even a man. I was a broken boy. But I promise you, whatever it is that you surrender to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, when he gets a hold of it, let me say it like, when he gets a hold of you, the devil better watch out. When, when, when you surrender your heart, when you surrender your life, when you give up whatever you have in your hands, so to speak, just like Moses did, the devil better look out. Are you hearing me right now? Woo. Come on. I'm getting ready to close with this. You know probably this scripture better than I do, most of you. And you know the account. Moses went back to Egypt. He took that staff, the rod of God, in his hand. And he went and he faced Pharaoh. And he did what he did with God. He threw it on the ground. It turned into a snake. Pharaoh called his magicians. Come in. There's staffs turned into a snake. But I love the scripture. Moses is... The rod of God that he had in his hand. When it was a snake, it ate all theirs up. Come on, somebody. Why? Because God is not going to be outclassed by some devil in hell. Are you hearing me right now? So uh, that was good. Amen. That was good. Then what's he do? He takes the rod of God and performs signs, wonders, and miracles. He stands out over the water. And the waters, all the waters in Egypt, the rivers, everything began to turn to blood when he held the rod of God out over the waters. And then you know the the greatest uh, passage of all concerning the rod of God when it concerns Moses and the children of Israel. He now is leaving with the children of Israel. He's telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And finally, after the tenth plague, the plague of death, he says, okay, you can leave. So Moses and the children of Israel, they're leaving, and they come up to the Red Sea. And you know the story. Moses held the rod of God out over the water, and the water parted. Come on, somebody. Some of you are at a Red Sea moment in your life. Oh, I feel that right now. Some of you, I believe our nation is at a Red Sea moment. But God, if we surrender, are you hearing me? If we surrender it to God... He's going to do a Red Sea moment in the nation, in the church. Some of you are at a Red Sea moment in your marriage. 
There's a Red Sea, but if you just surrender your marriage, are you hearing me? You surrender it unto God and hold it out. That Red Sea is going to split wide open. You're going to walk through on dry ground. Some of you are in need of a miracle. Some of you are in need of a new job. You're tired. You're restless. You're broke, busted, and disgusted. But if you just take what's in your hand and you give it, you think that's funny. That's awesome, ain't it? I love that saying. Broke, busted, and disgusted. But if you just take it and you surrender it to God, you're going to have a Red Sea moment. Are you hearing me right now? Who am I talking to in this place? Who, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Stand to your feet right now. God's getting ready to do some amazing things in here. What's in your hand? Capital One says, what's in your wallet? God's saying, but what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What do you have that you need to surrender to God? All I have, God, is a stick. But I'll give it to you. I don't have much, God. I've got my life. Right now, it may not seem like much. But I'll give it to you. I don't have much, God, but what I have, I'm going to surrender it to you because I know you're going to use it for your glory. I want every head bowed, every eye closed in this house. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the illustration that you gave me with the staff, God. The rod that was in Moses' hand and it turned to the rod of God. Thank you. And Lord, I believe there's many in this house today, even though the crowd's small because of the weather, but Lord, you knew it. You knew it. You knew, and even Kathy said, the ones that are supposed to be here will be here. Lord, you knew the ones that would drive, that would be in this house today. I believe, Lord, you have called them for such a time as this, and they are here today to, to hear this word. And I pray, God, for the ones that are here and that heard this, that seem like their life is failing or falling apart or they feel less than or insignificant. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would have an encounter with you to where they would surrender their life, surrender their hearts to you. And Lord, you would use it for your glory, that you, your anointing, your power would be manifested in their life. I pray for marriages right now. Let there be a Red Sea moment. I pray right now for, for miracle jobs. Open up. And I pray that you right now, God, would part that Red Sea for some that are needing that miracle job. Let them begin to walk through with favor and anointing. And Lord, I pray right now for the ones that are just here and, and, and they're confused about life and they feel like they have nothing to offer you. God, I pray that you begin to tug on their heart. Because that's what you want. You want our hearts. And Lord, we surrender it all to you. We lift our hands and we surrender it all to you today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.